Hello and welcome to this GCSE chemistry explanation video about testing for gases. We'll take a look at how we test for hydrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide and chlorine and also focus in on the topics where you might encounter these gases. Exam questions about gases might tell you a bit about an experiment where one of these gases is produced, so it might involve some aspect of collecting these gases. Now, these gases can be bubbled through water and collected in an upside down tube that's got water in them. And so the gases might displace the water, pushing it down as the bubbles of gas collect at the top of the tube. So this might be a test tube inside a bowl of water and delivering the gas into them or it might be a measuring cylinder, or it could even be a gas syringe, which is a lot easier because it doesn't involve the displacement of water, just a plunger being pushed out on the syringe, recording the volume of gas that has been produced. But you don't need to record the volume of gas that's being produced if you're collecting these gases. You just need to know how you test for the gases, so what it is that you need to do, and what the positive result is for these gases. So in other words, what would you observe if you were testing for these gases? And so in an exam question, sometimes it might just be a one mark question asking you what you need to do to test for a gas. So that would then be the top of these two options. But on other occasions, it might be a two mark question. And so you'd need to cover both the test and what the positive result would be. And frustratingly, in those situations, you need to have stated the correct test in order to get that second mark for the positive result. So really, it's more important that you know what you do than you know the positive result, because without knowing what you do, you won't get the result mark. And as well as covering those two things for each of these four gases, I'll also let you know which topics you might encounter these gases. So where in the rest of the course might you come across these gases in a different situation? Hydrogen gas has got the chemical formula H2. This tells us quite a few things about hydrogen. First of all, it's an element because it only contains one type of atom. And there are two atoms of hydrogen bonded together. And this will be a covalent bond because hydrogen is a non-metal. And once those two atoms are bonded together, they will make a molecule. And because it's a gas, we would write a little g after the formula to indicate the state symbol for this element. When we test for hydrogen, we might take a tube of hydrogen gas that's in a test tube. We would remove the bung and then we would take a burning splint, which we might say a lit splint. But what's absolutely crucial is that there is a flame. And then when we move this splint towards the neck of the test tube, if hydrogen gas is present, that gas will burn with a squeaky pop sound. And the crucial words there are the pop sound. You can get away without saying the squeaky parts, but we must mention the pop. There are a number of different topics where you might encounter hydrogen gas. So I'm going to go through some of them here. First of all, it is produced when a metal reacts with an acid. So, for instance, if we put zinc into sulfuric acid, we would make zinc sulfate salt, which would be dissolved in the solution. But we would also produce hydrogen gas. And so we could collect that in an upside down test tube or we could just put our thumb over the top of that flask and then wait for the gas to build up and test for it with the lit splint and we get our squeaky pop. Additionally, you encounter hydrogen in the alkali metal section of the periodic table because when you put the alkali metal into water, it fizzes and this fizzing is hydrogen gas being produced. And if you put the lit splint near the piece of lithium in the trough while it's reacting with the water, you will get a series of little pop sounds and the lithium might set on fire with a red flame. Hydrogen gas can also be produced during the electrolysis of solutions. It might be that the gas forms at the negative electrode and you might be asked to test for the presence of hydrogen by collecting it and then testing it with a lit splint. Hydrogen is also sometimes produced as a product of a cracking reaction. And additionally, hydrogen is a raw material in the harbour process where we make ammonia. So there are a variety of different contexts where you might encounter hydrogen gas. 
Oxygen gas has got the formula O2, and I'm going to put that state symbol G after it again. This tells us that oxygen is also an element because we only have one type of atom, and again it's a diatomic molecule with two oxygens joined together with a covalent bond to make a simple molecule. This time, because oxygen's in group 6, it's actually a doubly bonded molecule with a double covalent bond. To test for oxygen gas, we would take a tube of oxygen and we would remove the bung and we would bring towards it a glowing splint. And a glowing splint is one that has been on fire recently, but we've blown it out and there is no flame there anymore. And that's really, really important. And when we move this glowing splint towards the neck of the test tube and possibly we tilt it down and bring it into the test tube itself, that splint will relight. And this is because oxygen gas supports burning and the glowing splint is almost burning. And so the presence of that oxygen is enough to finish off this combustion process and to make that flame relight. So the crucial words for the oxygen test are a glowing splint and that splint will relight. Oxygen gas comes up in a few different topics, primarily the atmosphere topic in chemistry because oxygen is 20% of our atmosphere and so a question about the atmosphere might have something in it about testing for oxygen gas. Within this same topic, we cover a little bit of photosynthesis because that's where the oxygen in our atmosphere came from. And so an exam question might be getting you to think about photosynthesis, perhaps with some algae that is photosynthesizing in a diagram of the experiment. And they could get you to comment on the gas that is being produced, maybe getting you to work out that it is oxygen. Or they might say gas bubbles were collected as the algae photosynthesized. Describe how you could prove that that gas was oxygen. And then we'd be saying we'd test it with a glowing splint and it would relight if it was oxygen. One final example that comes up every now and then is hydrogen peroxide's decomposition. You learn about this a little bit in biology because this is catalyzed by an enzyme, but hydrogen peroxide decomposes into water and oxygen. It does it very slowly without the presence of a catalyst. But with a catalyst, it does it much faster, fast enough that we can collect this oxygen gas and then test it. And in a situation like this, part of the question might be getting you to show that you know how we can prove that it's oxygen gas that's been produced as a result of this decomposition. Chlorine has got the chemical formula Cl2, which means that there are two atoms of chlorine covalently bonded together to make a simple molecule. It's also a gas at room temperature, so we give it the state symbol G. And the test for chlorine is really quite simple. All you need is a piece of blue litmus paper and some water. Because what we do is we dip our blue litmus paper into water to make it damp. We take the lid off our test tube and we bring that damp blue litmus paper towards the neck of the tube. Maybe we put it inside the tube a little bit, but it doesn't need to go in far because the chlorine gas will come out of that tube and it will interact with the litmus paper. And so the test is simply damp litmus paper. And the result that shows you that we've made chlorine is that litmus paper turns white. So all we need to say is damp litmus paper turns white. You encounter chlorine in quite a few different topics. First of all, the periodic table topic, you need to know about the halogens, which is group seven of the periodic table and the place where we find chlorine. So you could encounter it there. You could also encounter it in the electrolysis topic, for instance, in the electrolysis of sodium chloride solution. And that's because chlorine is produced during this electrolysis and you might be required to test for the presence of chlorine. So you might hold the damp litmus paper above the electrolysis equipment and that damp litmus paper going white proves that we're making chlorine. You also encounter chlorine in the water topic because you need to know how we sterilize water and chlorine gas is the most common way of sterilizing water. So as part of a bigger question about something to do with water, you might be told that chlorine gas is used to sterilize water and you might be asked to describe how you would prove the presence of chlorine gas. 
Carbon dioxide has got the chemical formula CO2. Now, both of those symbols are capital letters, which means we've got two different elements in this gas. We've got carbon and we've got oxygen. We've got two oxygen. You can tell that from the formula. And that's why it's carbon dioxide. That di means two oxygen atoms. It's also a gas. It's got the little g state symbol. And if we were testing for carbon dioxide, we'd need to have the carbon dioxide in a tube or maybe being produced in a reaction. And we would bubble the gas that has been produced through lime water. Lime water has a chemical name of calcium hydroxide solution. The name lime water is the one that is referred to most often, but you also need to know that it is a solution of calcium hydroxide. I should say that lime water is named for the fact that it's derived from limestone. It's nothing to do with the fruit. And when you bubble carbon dioxide gas through lime water, it turns milky or it turns cloudy. Now, that's actually the formation of a precipitate of calcium carbonate. That's why it's made that change. But you need to know that it is lime water that turns cloudy. Carbon dioxide gas comes up in a number of different topics. First of all, in the chemical changes topic, you encounter carbon dioxide because it is produced when metal carbonates react with acid. So you might have copper carbonate in a conical flask, add some acid to it. This will, of course, produce a salt in the conical flask, but carbon dioxide gas will be produced. It will move through the delivery tube and bubble into the lime water and make it go cloudy. In the same topic, you encounter thermal decomposition of metal carbonates. And if you take a metal carbonate and you heat it, it breaks apart and produces a metal oxide and carbon dioxide gas. And if you bubble that gas through lime water, it will go cloudy. Carbon dioxide is also a product of a combustion reaction. And so in the hydrocarbons topic, you learn about the combustion of hydrocarbons to produce carbon dioxide and water. So you could, of course, be asked to balance an equation for this combustion. And then they will point out that a gas is produced in this reaction. And they could ask you to describe a test to prove that the gas produced was carbon dioxide. You also encounter carbon dioxide as a product of the fermentation process. So you might see a cask with yeast and a solution of sugar in water, and that is then connected via a delivery tube to lime water, and part of the fermentation process produces carbon dioxide gas, and the lime water will go cloudy, proving this. The most important part of this video is the test for the gas and the positive result that proves that that gas is present. And so this can be tested in a few different ways. They could simply give you a two mark question and say, how could you prove that you've got carbon dioxide gas being produced? Or it could be that you're given the gases and the tests and you're required to match them up perhaps just carbon dioxide and oxygen, but you've got all the four different tests that you have to choose from. Alternatively, you might be asked to prove that a gas is not present. So a question might say, explain how a sample could be tested to show that carbon dioxide is not present in the mixture. And you would have to say that you would use lime water or bubble the gas through lime water and that this lime water would not turn milky. Or they might tell you that a student is testing the gas produced in a reaction by bubbling it through lime water and they then say that no change is seen in the lime water. And you could be asked to give a conclusion that the student could make about the gas being produced. And in this situation, we would simply say that the gas is not carbon dioxide or that no carbon dioxide gas is present. OK, that's the end of this video. Thanks for listening.